And now here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We invite you to get your Bible and join us today. We're going to pick it up in the fourth book of Moses, Bamidbar, in the wilderness, in the Hebrew language, the book of Numbers, chapter 25, verse 10, is where we're going to pick it up today. In our last lecture, we saw that Balak, the king of Moab, unsuccessfully tried to uh, promote Balaam with riches and honor uh, on the condition that Balaam would curse Israel. Um, Balak was afraid of the people of Israel thinking that uh, they just defeated the Amorites who took a big part of the Moabites land within oh, several decades earlier and he was afraid they were going to take all of Moab's land at that point. So he wanted Balaam to curse them where they could be defeated. And he also pulled into an ally, the Midianites and anyone else he could get his hands on. But uh, the Lord blessed Israel and Balaam said, how can I curse uh, a people that the Lord has blessed? And of course he couldn't. But uh, that was plan A. It was unsuccessful. Plan B was to seduce Israel into worshiping the gods, small g, of the Moabites and the Midianites, and then God himself would curse Israel. And uh, his, his name is Jealous. Uh, Exodus chapter 34, uh, verse 14, God says, don't worship other gods. Uh, the Lord is a jealous God. My name is Jealous, he said. So uh, it makes him very angry when his people fall into idolatry. And that's what happened in the beginning of chapter 25. Uh, and a plague came upon the people of Israel, and there were 24,000 who died. Uh, Phinehas, being zealous for the Lord, the son of Eleazar, the high priest, uh, took a spear or a javelin and followed an Israelite who had taken a Medianite woman uh, and was into his tent and ran them both through. And God saw uh, the zealousness of Phinehas and stopped the plague. So with that, let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day, chapter 25, verse 10, the book of Numbers, and it reads... And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, there's going to be a covenant uh, made between the Lord and uh, Phinehas. Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, better grandson of Aaron, the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them. In the Hebrew, this is he was uh, with my zeal, the Lord speaking, that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. And as I quoted just a moment ago, Exodus chapter 34, verse 14, thou shalt not worship uh, other gods, uh, for the Lord uh, whose name is jealous is a jealous God. Verse 12, wherefore say, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace uh, to grant uh, what is going to be promised in the next verse that follows. And he shall have it, this referring to Phinehas, and his seed after him, this is perpetual from uh, his children on into eternity, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel, and this uh, was only briefly interrupted. You may recall in your studies of First Samuel that there was a high priest at that time by the name of Eli, also his sons. Uh, they were not of the, the family of Eleazar, but of Aaron's other son, uh, one of his younger sons, Ithamar. And whether there simply wasn't a man old enough at the time of the house of Eleazar or why that happened is not clear, but uh, 
the house of Ithamar didn't make very good high priests. Uh, uh, Eli had two sons, as it's written in 1 Samuel chapter 2, and they were ripping off the people. Uh, the portions of offerings that were to be gods, uh, they would ask the people, cut the fat a little extra thick on the, the steaks today, and the fat belongs to God. They were also taking part of the uh, sacrifices that were to be the offerers to partake of, uh, in the case of peace offerings. And then also they were laying with women who came to serve at the tabernacle. And uh, the house of, of Ithamar didn't remain in power as the high priest for very long at all due to the annex of Eli and his sons. Verse 14, now the name of the Israelite that was slain, this is the one that uh, Phinehas went in and drove through with a javelin, even that was slain with the Medianitish woman was Zimri, the son of Salu, a prince of a chief house among the Simeonites. This chief house is a house of a father. And you know, it would have been bad enough if Zimri had just been a commoner. He wasn't. He, he was a, a leader of the tribe of Simeon, and rather than being a good example to the people of Israel as to how to uh, avoid uh, idolatry, he was right in there partaking. And this was in a physical sense, but you can bet he was spiritually involved as well. <clears throat> not setting a good example. Sharpen up for me, verse 15. And the name of the Medianitish woman that was slain was Cosby, the daughter of Zur. He was head over a people and of a chief house in Median. Now, uh, in our last lecture, I referred to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse 8, where Paul exhorts us, you know, to not be like these people who, who partook of idolatry. And in fact, the first several verses of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 are concerning this very people that we're studying about now, Israel, as they came out of the land of Egypt. And Paul goes on in, in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 10 to warn us. He said, these things, referring to the things that happened to these people we're studying about, happened as an insample or an example uh, to you of the latter days. That's now, the generation of the fig tree. For an admonition, in other words, for a warning. Now, there's a warning for us here in this verse. What is it? Cosby, what does it mean if you translate it rather than transliterate it? It means false. Zer, many of you know in the Hebrew, means rock. What is our warning here? It's false rock. Uh, those of you in the end time, you need to be aware that there is a false Christ who comes first. Uh, there are all too many of our brothers and sisters who are set up to be deceived by the Antichrist, by the false rock. As it's written in Deuteronomy chapter 32, the Song of Moses, that there are two rocks, and our rock, Jesus Christ, is not their rock. The warning, beware of the false rock. 16, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, now we're about to see the order to annihilate, uh, well, of course, back in chapter 24, we learned that Moab was going to be uh, distressed from border to border. And we're about to see the order to, uh, to annihilate the Medianites as well. And why? Well, Christ said it very well himself in Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. Uh, when he was addressing the church of Pergamos, he said, I have somewhat against you because you hold with the doctrine of Balaam uh, who taught Balak to seduce or be a stumbling block to the children of Israel. Verse 17, vex or afflict the Midianites and smite them. And why would God order this? Because of their plan B uh, to seduce 
the people of Israel into idolatry. Verse 18, for they vex or afflict you with their wiles, with their deceit, this could be translated, wherewith they have beguiled you in the matter of Peor, the same as Baal Peor back in verse 3 of this chapter, and in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of a prince of Median, their sister, in other words, a member of their tribe, the Medianites, which was slain in the day of the plague for Peor's sake. And this command by our father will pick back up when we get to chapter 31. And in fact, we see Balaam is slain along with uh, the Medianites when we get to chapter 31. Now, it's here it's time to number Israel once again. And this is a totally different numbering than what we had in chapter one of the, the 12 tribes of Israel. And why are we numbering here? Well, it's very appropriate because God has just put forth the order to afflict the Medianites and the Moabites as well. And if you're gonna go to war, you need something, you need an army. And that's the purpose of a numbering of the people of Israel is a mustering uh, of the troops. So. Uh, we've got a fresh numbering. Uh, a lot of this is a little bit slow, a little bit dry, uh, but we'll try and make it interesting by uh, comparing the counts of the various tribes. And, and I want you to consider, you know, if you have children, uh, you should consider yourself to be blessed of the Lord. In fact, the, the more children you have, the more blessed you are seen as. Uh, that's the same with a congregation of, of a church. Uh, if you have the more your growth that you have is seen as being blessed of the Lord. And it's the same with the, this numbering of the children of Israel. If, if your people are increased, you're blessed. And Simeon, uh, who, uh, Zimri, who one of the, the chief of the fathers of Simeon, uh, was very much involved in, in committing idolatry. And we're going to see their numbers were greatly diminished as we work our way through chapter 26. And also keep in mind that this is a very important numbering in chapter 26 because that generation that tempted the Lord some 10 times and back in chapter 14 of this book of Numbers, uh, God sentenced or judged that generation to die in the wilderness. And they're just about died out at this point. So uh, only those who were 20 years or actually younger than 20 years old, 19 and less, at the time that judgment was given by our Father, are gonna be allowed to enter the promised land with the exception of Caleb and Joshua, who were two of the spies in chapter 13 of Numbers who went into the promised land to check it out. When they came back, you remember the other 10 said, oh, there are giants over there. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. There's no way that we can defeat them. Whereas Caleb and Joshua said, that land is ours. God gave it to us. Let's go. Now, this numbering is also going to be utilized to determine who gets what land and how much land. The more people in a tribe, uh, the more land that's going to be given. Uh, in chapter one of this book, we didn't see the names of the different various families, large family groups of the various tribes mentioned, but we're gonna see them mentioned in chapter 26, and it's just because of the same fact that I just said, and that is this numbering, not only mustering the troops as they prepare to take on the Medianites, but also as they prepare to uh, allot the land, the inheritance in the promised land. Chapter 26, verse 1. And it came to pass after the plague that the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saying, and of course Eleazar, uh, now the high priest, uh, since Aaron uh, passed away back in chapter 20, you may recall, Eleazar was promoted to the high priesthood at that time. And note that here it's in verse 1, it says it came to pass after the plague, that's the plague that 24,000 died 
I think a lot of those 24,000 were of the tribe of Simeon uh, because of what happened with Zimri in chapter 25. Two, take the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel from 20 years old and upward throughout their father's house, all that are able to go to war in Israel. And here you have the numbers uh, of the people that would have been 19 years and younger. So consider, at this point in time, we're 38 years, let's say 40 years, just for easy figuring, down the road from the last numbering. And so these people, none of them would be over 60 years old, with the exception of Caleb and Joshua. Um, and you've got a few others, Moses and, and Eleazar, are still there, but they won't be allowed to enter the promised land. Verse 3, And Moses and Eleazar the priest spake with them in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, Now we're getting real close to where Israel would cross over River Jordan into the promised land. Uh, Joshua chapter 6 verse 20 uh, we learned that soon after Israel crossed the River Jordan, uh, they took on the city of Jericho, and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down, very close to the Promised Land. Take the sum of the people from 20 years old and upward, as the Lord commanded Moses and the children of Israel which went forth out of the land of Egypt, and the, the fighting men of the armies of the Lord. Reuben, the eldest son of Israel, and same as Jacob after God changed his name to Israel, the children of Reuben, Hanok, Hanok uh, is the same as Enoch, now I'm not saying uh, this is Enoch of the first several chapters of Genesis. It's simply the same name, uh, just translated or transliterated a little differently. And whom cometh the family of the Hanakites of Pelu, the family of the Peluites? Pelu means uh, distinguished if you translate it. Verse 6, and these are the families of the Reubenites of Hezron. Hezron means courtyard the family of the Hezronites, and Carmi, which means gardener, the family of the Carmiites. And you know, after wandering around in the desert for 40 years, I would imagine this younger generation, the idea of having a courtyard where they could have a garden was uh, a pleasant uh, thought. Verse 7, these are the families of the Reubenites, and they were numbered of them, were f they that were numbered of them were forty and three thousand and seven hundred and thirty. Forty-three thousand seven hundred and thirty. Uh, they were forty-six thousand five hundred in chapter one, verse twenty-one. And we talked a little bit about the blessings and cursings of God. Uh, there's a chapter in the book of Leviticus, uh, chapter twenty-six that goes into the blessings and cursings of God. And it's written in Leviticus 26, 9, God says, if you'll do things my way, I will multiply you. you know, you'll have lots of children. But then he goes on to say, if you don't do things his way, the curse of 26, 22, uh, God says, you know, if you walk contrary to me, I will walk contrary to you and I will send wild beasts among you to rob you of your children. Be blessed and be multiplied, be cursed, and have your children robbed. Verse 9, And the sons of Eliab, Nimuel, which means day of God, and Dathan, and Abiram, you might remember those names, this is that Dathan and Abiram that were famous in the congregation. They were well known in the congregation, not for good reason. Why they were the ones who joined Korah in his rebellion in challenging the authority of Moses and Aaron. And as a result, God, who was the one who appointed Moses and Aaron. 
who strove against Moses and against Aaron in the company of Korah when they strove against the Lord. And how did they strive against the Lord again by challenging the authority of Moses and Aaron? You might recall Korah is the one who approached Moses and Aaron in chapter 16, and he, and they, you know, he was their first cousin. And he said, you, you, you take too much upon yourselves. You know, the people of Israel are holy. Why do you put yourself in a position over them? And they didn't put themselves in a position over the people of Israel. God did. And that's where Korah made his mistake in recognizing that fact. Verse 10, And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up together with Korah, when that company died, what time the fire devoured 250 men, and they became a sign, uh, as a warning, in other words. And we got a pretty good little review of what we've been studying here in the book of Numbers. These were the 250 that Moses told to put fire in their censers and appear before the tabernacle, and we'll see who God has chosen uh, to be the priesthood of Israel, and God consumed them with fire. Uh, their little censers were completely melted, and God instructed Moses to tell Eleazar to beat their melted censers into plates and to mount them on the sides of the altar of burnt offering uh, as a reminder to the people of Israel, don't approach the tabernacle unless you are of the priesthood. 11, notwithstanding, the children of Korah died not. And what the, this is referring to is that in chapter 16, verses 26 and 27, Moses, uh, at God's instruction, told the people, including the sons of Korah, to separate themselves and to get away from them. Don't even touch anything that belongs to theirs. And it's obvious that some of them obeyed Moses uh, because in the book of Psalms we even have uh, the sons of Korah who were uh, renowned singers or musicians, if you will, uh, very well known and, and, and liked and admired. Verse 12, the sons of Simeon, now here we take up the tribe who was involved with the idolatry, uh, not that all of them weren't to some extent, but certainly Simeon at the lead of the pack, after their families of Nimuel, again, name or day of God, I should say, and Jamin, which means right hand, the family of the Jamanites, and Jachin, the family of the Jachinites. Jachin meaning he will establish. And you may recall in uh, that the temple at the time that Sol Solomon had the tabernacle built, uh, there were two pillars out front. Uh, make a note of 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 21, if you're not familiar with this, but one of the pillars was to be named Jachin, which means he will establish. The other, the left pillar was named Boaz, which means in it is strength, and both referring to inside the tabernacle was the home of God on earth at that time, and certainly in him is strength, and uh, or in him is strength, and he will establish. Verse 13, we continue with the Simeonites of Zira, which means rising of light, the family of the Zarhites, and Sheol, which means asked, the family of the Sheolites. Verse 14, these are the families of the Simeonites, 20 and 2,200, 22,200 here, some 38 years earlier, there were 59,300 in chapter 1, verse 23. And I think it's safe to say a good number of those 24,000 who died as a result of the plague were probably Simeonites, greatly reduced because of their prince Zimri and what he did with the Medianite uh, princess Cosby. 15, the children of Gad after their families 
of Ziphon, the family of the Zephonites, of Haggai, Haggai means festive, the family of the Haggaiites, and Shunai, uh, which means to rest or, or be quiet, if you will, uh, Smith's Bible Dictionary translated fortunate, the family of the Shunites. Now, uh, Zephon, which means watch, is called Ziphion in Genesis chapter 46, verse 16. Verse 16, of Ozni, and Ozni is called uh, Ezbon in Genesis chapter 46, verse 18. The family of the Oznites and Eri, uh, the family of the Erites, Eri meaning watchful, four, or 17. Of Arod, which means fugitive, the family of the Aradites, and Arilai, the family of the Arilites, Arilai meaning heroic. Verse 18, these are the families of the children of Gad according to those that were numbered of them, 40,500, 45,500 of the tribe of Gad, uh, 45,650 in uh, chapter 1, verse 25, so uh, a little bit of a reduction, but almost insignificant. Verse 19, the sons of Judah were Ur and Onan, and Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. Now this was long before Israel even went into uh, subjection to Egypt. And what happened there was Judah, which was the king line that uh, Messiah was to come through, took a Canaanitish wife and had two sons, actually three. Uh, one of them was Ur, one of them was Onan. Uh, God could not have them uh, with their seed line polluting uh, the seed line through which Jesus Christ would come. And they were both killed by the Lord. In fact, uh, Tamar uh, is one of them that was married to Ur and uh, when Ur died, uh, Judah wanted uh, her to take the youngest of the three sons, but he was too young. So she sent, he sent, Judah sent Tamar back to her land and said, we'll call you when he's old enough. Well, the call never came. And, uh, but again, the Lord protecting that sea line through which Christ would come, verse 20. And the sons of Judah, after their families, were of Shelah, uh, Shelah meaning request, the family of the Shelanites, and Perez, which means to break or a breach, that would be the seed line through which Christ would come, the family of the Pharsites, and Zerah, which means a rising of light, the family of the Zarhite. Now, uh, in verse 21, and the sons of Perez, by the way, the Zira and uh, Perez were twins that were born eventually uh, to Tamar as well. Verse 21, and the sons of Perez were of Hezron, the family of the Hezronites, Hezron again meaning courtyard, of Hamul, the family of the Hamulites. Hamul, uh, if you look it up in the Strong's, means pitied but uh, the Smith's Bible Dictionary translated surrounded by a wall, the tribe of Judah, 22. These are the families of Judah according to those that were numbered of them, threescore and 16,500, by far the largest of the 12 tribes of Israel, 76,500. They had grown from 74,600 in chapter one uh, of this same book. And again, the more people in the tribe, the more land that they were allotted in the promised land. 23, of the sons of Issachar after their families, of Tola, the family of the Tolites, and Pua, the same as P-H-U-V-A-H, in another place in the Bible, the family of the Punites. Uh, tola means warm, uh, Pua means a uh, warm, uh, or I should say a blast. 24, 
and Jashub, which is the same as Job, uh, which means persecuted, uh, of Genesis chapter 46, 13, the family of the Jashubites, and of Shimron, the family of the Shimronites, Shimron meaning uh, guardian or guardianship. These are the families of Issachar, according to those that were numbered of them, three score and four thousand and three hundred, sixty-four thousand three hundred, and they had grown from fifty-four thousand four hundred in chapter one, and that which would make them at this time the third largest of the tribes of Israel and a substantial increase. Of the sons of Zebulun, after their families of Sered, Sered meaning trembling, the family of the Sardites, of Elon, which means oak grove, the family of the Elonites, and Jalil, the family of the Jalilites, Jalil meaning expectant of God or hoping in God. These are the families of the Zebulonites according to those that were numbered of them, threescore thousand and five hundred, sixty thousand five hundred uh, had grown from fifty-seven thousand four hundred in chapter one in this same book. Twenty-eight, the sons of Joseph after their families were Manasseh and Ephraim. Joseph means double fruit. Now, Manasseh and Ephraim, both born before Israel left uh, the land of Egypt and would later be adopted by their grandfather, uh, Jacob, and therefore taking on the status of the, as the founders of two of the tribes of Israel. Uh, Joseph honored in that uh, his name meaning double fruit. Uh, his seed became two of the twelve tribes of Israel. Twenty-nine, of the sons of Manasseh, of Macher, Macher means salesman, the family of the Macherites, and Macher begat Gilead, uh, Gilead meaning heap of testimony, of Gilead come the family of the Gileadites. Verse 30, these are the sons of Gilead, of Jezer, uh, the family of the Jezrites and Halek, uh, that family of the Halekites. And I guess that's a good place to stop for today. And we'll, we'll come back, and again, I know that this is a little bit slow and a little bit dry with the numbering, but again, it was seen by the people as something very important at this time because, again, the main purpose of this numbering, actually two, one, mustering the troops to take on the the uh, Medianites and the Moabites also, this would be the count that would determine how much land each of the tribes would inherit in the promised land. And you know, once that was established, that land stayed in that tribe from that point on. That's, that, that was set in stone. So and every uh, jubilee, if it had changed any during that time, uh, every 50 years at the jubilee, everything went back to the way that God said it. And, and you know, that's just the way it's going to be when uh, Jesus Christ returns. Things are going to be set back just like they were. The earth is going to be uh, rejuvenated when the Lord's throne returns, as it's written in Revelation chapter 21. We'll come back on our next in, uh, lecture and finish this numbering and see what's up next for the tribes of Israel. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please?